We can start when you're ready, Susan. And Nick, Alberto, we're good to go. Good evening. Welcome to everyone. It is a great honor and pleasure to welcome Nicholas Griffin, author of The Year of Dangerous Days, Riots, Refugees, and Cocaine in Miami in 1980. Tonight, the Council of the Americas and the American Society are so delighted to be presenting that book. And what a and who could be better to interview him than Alberto Ibarguin, president and CEO of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Now, as I said, they're here tonight to discuss the latest book on how Miami survived 1980 when the city faced race riots, a burgeoning refugee crisis, and an explosion of the cocaine industry, all during an already turbulent election year. As I read the book, what struck me was the extensive and detailed research, and of course, the recounting of a moment in South Florida in those days. And as I read it, I even thought of some of the parallels for today, because as you know, we're facing in an election year, many challenges, related to COVID and other things. I then went on to read the reviews about the book, which were just one after another, staggeringly wonderful reviews. I wanna thank this evening our co-hosts, my dear friends, Patricia Phelps de Cisneros and Gustavo Cisneros. They're wonderful friends of mine and wonderful participants for many years in the America Society, leaders of the America Society and founders with David Rockefeller. Now to talk a little bit about Nicholas, he's a journalist and author of four novels and three works of nonfiction. His writing has appeared in the Times in London and the Financial Times, Foreign Policy. His book, Ping Pong Diplomacy, was shortlisted for the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing. And I remember, Nicholas, the launch of that book, but we could do that in person. Alberto, um, I also wanna spend a little time talking about you because you're the former uh, publisher of the Miami Herald and then Nuevo Herald. During his tenure, the Miami Herald won three Pulitzer Prizes and then Nuevo Herald won Spain's Ortega he gets that prize for excellence in the Spanish language journalism. For his work to protect journalists in Latin America, he received a Maria Moore's Cabot citation from Columbia University. Tonight, if we are gonna ask you uh, to please, we're gonna mute your microphones. If you would like to answer question, ask a question, please use the Q&A feature or send a private chat to ASCOA programs. It is again a great pleasure to have you here with us tonight, Nick, to launch your book. And I am now going to turn it over to Alberto uh, and Nick. Uh, Alberto, the floor is yours. And thank you to everyone for being with us today. Thank you very, very much, Susan. Um, I appreciate the introduction and I, and I appreciate that you've uh, said very good things about my friend, Nick Griffin. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, uh, uh, really, really enjoyed this book. As a former newspaper man, I enjoyed it, first of all, because it's written in a journalistic style. It is written um, with the fast pace of a, of a, of a daily newspaper. Um, and it's written and it has as one of its protagonists, one of the great crime writers of all time, Edna Buchanan, uh, who used to write at the Miami Herald. What I most enjoyed about it <clears throat> is that it's one of those one of those books that gives you in a in a in a in 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 one sitting um, the foundation for the city you thought you knew. Um, th this was a this was a careening moment if you think about 
uh, a pool shot. This was this was a triple bank shot that happened in 1980 that uh, that not only changed the course of Miami, but I think uh, really uh, created uh, the 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 city that we know uh, that we know today. Uh, it's particularly important because it's a it's a crux, and I want Nick to talk about this. It's the it's where the Latinization, the Latin Americanization of Miami <clears throat> really crystallized, um, and and the city that had been aspiring to become a southern version of a northern city uh, suddenly turned around and looked south for its future and its importance. At the same time uh, that there were all manner of social issues going on, uh, very reminiscent of the kind of racial uh, and ethnic divisions that we're seeing today, including the violations of civil rights, the murder of an individual, um, and um, and the explosion that occurred um, uh, after. And then the infusion of uh, black market drug um, uh, money uh, into the city um, uh, and the corruption that that inevitably ensues all happening at the same time. It's hard not to make reference to a Malcolm Gladwell tipping point where a series of unrelated events suddenly came together and created um, a uh, a new trajectory for uh, for that community. So let me start um, with with that with that uh, with that approach to the to the book as and the, and in a sense the the reason why this is an important book at the council and at, uh, it seems to me uh, at the Council of the Americas seems to me that it's uh, it really explains. Uh, how Miami came to be such an important, I wouldn't say the capital of Latin America because it isn't the capital of anything. It isn't the capital of Florida. It is, it is however, the preferred meeting place between North and South, and that had to begin someplace. Um, and I think Nick makes a very good argument for 1980. What drew you to that year? Were you were you specifically uh, looking at these three things, or at the kind of confluence of these things, or did you um, did you happen on it as you were researching the history of the town? For me, uh, what I was trying to do was was so tell, I suppose, the origin story of modern Miami. And when I first took on the idea, I was actually looking at something much much broader. I was looking at I thought I'd throw my arms around sort of 1979 to 1985 and take a slightly wider approach. Uh, and, you know, people, as, as I moved down here about seven years ago, and, you know, as I was trying to understand the city and people would start talking about these sort of watershed events, you know, three subjects came up again and again and again. One, people always give you this vague idea. They point at the, the uh, you know, the, our, our cityscape and they go, that's a cityscape built entirely by cocaine. And yet no one would really say anything beyond that. You know, no one really would line up the evidence. So, you know, I was wondering to what extent that was or wasn't true. Then people would always talk about the Mariel boat lift and having this huge surge of 125,000 uh, immigrants not pushed into a country, but pushed into one city. Uh, and then the McDuffie riots, which were what the New York Times described them as the largest race riots of the century. Uh, uh, which I'm not sure is entirely right, but they certainly were huge, huge and vitally important and long forgotten riots. Uh, and so, I, you know, the light bulb went off as I started trying to dig around that actually all three of those events didn't simply happen in the same year. Uh, they actually happened within six weeks of one another. So that sort of set all sorts of light bulbs going inside, inside my brain and realizing that maybe uh, my focus should be not on a sort of six year period, but, uh, but if I could really get to know 1918 takes really, really deep inside that year, I could probably tell exactly the same story that I wanted to tell without going outside those parameters. Did you, did you approach this with a, uh, with, a, um, uh, how should I say it, a, a great man theory of how history happens or a, uh, uh, an events theory that says 
events uh, events will happen. Uh, people will careen against each other, and leaders will emerge from it. Well, I thought I was going with a bit of a great man or great woman theory of Miami until I went to interview interview the first great man, you know, one of my three central figures in this book, uh, the mayor, Maurice Ferre. And it was Maurice Ferre who sat me down and told me, look, if you want to understand Miami, think of three things, geography, geography, geography. Everything that's happened to Miami is because of geography and all of his ideas for what Miami should be were very much to do with geography. And, you know, cocaine arrives in Miami because of geography. Cuban immigrants arrived in 1980 because of geography. And But I think the key thing there, and this is why I think the great man question is very valid, uh, is Maurice Ferre was a man and a mayor with one idea that was very much contrary to the prevalent ideas of, at the time that he was mayor. So I'm talking about early 70s when he first comes into power in 73. Uh, he has a very different vision for what Miami should be. And the Miami we live in today is 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 much closer to Mayor Ferre's vision for Miami than it was uh, correlated to the to the views of the the most prominent business leaders in the late 70s and 80s. They all wanted to turn Miami into some form of Jacksonville, New York, uh, still a bit here, still a bit there. But they were always looking north. Maurice Ferre was Puerto Rican born, uh, had a very different map in his head, uh, and in his head, you know, the map that he looked at should include the Caribbean. Central America, South America, and the southern part of North America. And if you look at that map, then Miami is actually this really central city and not this southern outpost. And that to Maurice was absolutely key. And that's the way he tried to drive the city uh, in the 70s and well into the 80s. Set, set the scene a little bit about uh, in, in 19, as I recall the stats, in, in 1960, the population of Miami was about 20% black, 5% Hispanic, and 75% in the parlance of Miami, 75% Anglo. Um, and then by 1980, I would guess it was probably about 20% blacks, no, no change, and about but about 40% Hispanic, and maybe the balance of uh, Anglo. Is that about is that about right? Yeah, you're pretty much exactly right for January 1980. Now, by December 1980, you've actually got an entirely different, you've got this huge shift because of the Mariel boat lift and, and to a lesser extent because of uh, the Haitian refugee crisis that happens in the same year. But it does change the demographics of Miami forever because that the fear that that puts into the Anglo population or don't, maybe not fear, but maybe discontent, also leads to a white flight that begins in 1980 as well. So you have this enormous, enormous shift uh, that goes on throughout that year. And the and the the population at that point was um, initially uh, Nicaraguan exiles, then Cuban exiles. The 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 thought, uh, the 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 self perception of the Hispanic population was that of an exile, which is I am, I am here temporarily and I'm returning. And then all of a sudden, 1980 um, creates a, a as, as I as I understand the history, uh, 1980 creates in a flash um, a population that has little or no intention or opportunity or 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 option to uh, to return? Well, I think it's very much a population that chooses a very different strategy during 1980 as a reaction to things that are happening that year. So if you look at the beginning of the year, 17% of Cuban Americans are registered to vote. So they have this huge population, 40% uh, in, in Miami, and yet they really have z close to zero political power at a local level uh, within the city. So what happens that year is after the Mariel boat lift, which is a really traumatic experience, not just most of all for the Mariel refugees themselves, but also for the city that just basically gets swamped. It's like, you know, it basically it was the same size of Providence, Rhode Island, just getting dumped on a city. But guess what? You don't have any jobs. You don't have any housing. You don't have any space in school. The city is already at a breaking point before it even begins. So what happens is you get this reaction uh, to Mariel, and that's included in the Cuban community as well. Uh, so, so you know, they're really un unwelcome in, in, they really are unwelcome that year. Uh, 
So, so, so there's a reaction. So unwelcome, just to, to not to put too fine a point on this, but they're unwelcome in part because of the well, the publicity surrounding Castro opening the jails and people and people generally thinking, oh my God, he's he is he is he has sent us the very worst of Cuban society. Number one, number two. Uh, these are economic, in a, in a sense, economic refugees as opposed to the uh, upper and upper middle class uh, political refugees of a previous generation. And then you have um, the Anglo population just simply saying, who needs the size of Providence, Rhode Island, moving in on you? And the black population saying, what am I, chopped liver, that all of a sudden these people are coming in and taking taking over and, and where where do we stand? Yeah, and you see that very much. There's a grassroots movement that, that takes place that summer, uh, which feels very reminiscent of sort of what's going on today within the Anglo population, where, where they decide to... Re Miami is actually officially, the county is bilingual uh, in 1980 and has been for about seven years. And there's this huge push uh, to put on the ballot that November that that should be rescinded. Uh, I think they need about 40,000 signatures they get about 250,000, 120,000 of which are presented, which, you know, which is just this huge, huge number. Uh, and sure enough, when it comes to election time, that's what happens. Miami is officially no longer a bilingual city as of, as of 1980. Uh, so for the Cubans who have thought of themselves as perhaps the most successful immigrant community ever to hit America, uh, who quite rightly could look around parts of Miami, such as downtown, and be like, hey, we rebuilt that, we rescued that. Uh, and suddenly it's a slap in the face to that community. And guess what? We, you know, you may think you're the, what, America's most successful immigrant community, but no one else in this town does anymore. Uh, if anything, there's not much liking for you. And that was the way it was taken. It was taken uh, as an offense. So what do you get? You get this incredible rush uh, for people to get organized and get involved in domestic politics. So by the time Mayor Ferre reruns in 1981, he has six Cuban-American challenges. That simply wouldn't have happened in, in 79. It didn't happen in 79, but there it is. That's how quick that changes. And that shift in population and that influx of uh of uh, of money uh, eventually leads to uh, what becomes a, a, a major uh, commercial and financial center between North and South in the in the future years, and that was very much Foray's uh, vision as a, as the, the that was the that was the possibility for the city. Yeah, that was the long that was the long term dream that had been building very well for seven years and to the point where in late 79 the financial times sends journalists to miami to sort of write the story of how miami has rebuilt itself as this sort of a uh, uh you know uh, a sort of bridge between between the americas but of course then 1980 happens and it seems very much as if this dream is going to fall apart at, at, at high speed but right. and some of some of that is because of some of the wonderful things that he had done to, to sort of promote Miami as a business sector, such as bringing all the edge act uh, banks down here. So suddenly Miami had an enormous amount of foreign and out of state banks. Uh, we had more edge act banks down here than New York City had. So, but guess what? Guess who were some of the biggest first clients for those banks? They, it, it wasn't the businesses that Maurice Ferro was hoping to attract. It was an enormous amount of cocaine money that also rushed into town at exactly the same time. So talk a little bit about uh, let's let's move a little bit into that and maybe you can move into the the the, the finance side and then into the into the uh, the 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 white collar and then the uh, the the cruder level of crime that uh, another of the heroes in the story N. W. Buchanan was uh, so brilliant in covering. Sure, I mean. Yeah, we. The funny thing about the cocaine was was it really wasn't the cocaine bloodshed or the cocaine itself that affected Miami the most. It was it was the cocaine money, uh, and that sort of rushes in before the violence. So the cocaine money really begins in earnest in '79, and it it arrives with such a rush that it sets off alarm bells in D.C. And you know you know as well as I do that not much happens fast in D.C. And yet. Uh, the numbers coming out of Miami were so outrageous that, that they put together something called Operation Greenback really quickly. So, so it, to give you a sense of the scope of, of what was happening down here, in 1979, 
when you look at the 12 uh, Fed, Fed regions around America, you would normally be running a, a deficit or a surplus of roughly $100 million, where they'd take a little money in or take a little money out. And suddenly South Florida in 79 had a $5 billion surplus. And then 1980, they were predicting seven, seven and a half billion dollar surplus. So basically, they realized very quickly that there was no such thing as a legitimate industry in Florida that, that had that sort of size. The entire tourism industry was around $5 billion. So it was as if this new industry, the largest industry, had arrived overnight. So it yeah. became pretty pretty obvious quickly that this was cocaine. Uh, and that, and then they sent this team called Operation Greenback down here, which was supposed to be large and effective. It was supposed to incorporate the IRS, Customs, federal prosecutors, DEA, and the FBI. And it should have, but this being sort of the siloed departments of the United States, the FBI refused to show up, and the DEA uh, don't really get involved until about 10 months into the year. So, so it leaves basically a team of 12 people trying who are given the mandate to figure out the entire of the cocaine industry. And, and they, do, they do a pretty impressive job, uh, but it's a, it's a lot to handle. They had no idea. The, the first mandate they're given when they hit town is to find any money launderer who's laundering over a million dollars. Within three months, they have to change that mandate to find any money launderer who's laundering over a hundred million dollars that's how much they didn't know in january and what they discovered by march that's that's phenomenal um introduce edna buchanan into all of this sure edna buchanan was this uh tiny blonde uh reporter who worked for the miami herald who covered covered crime uh she was she's she didn't finish high school. She was out of New Jersey, but I don't think you would have found a, a reporter in the rest of America who worked as hard as Edna Buchanan did. She she would, you know, she barely slept. Uh, she had police scanners, you know, at work, at home, and and in between. Uh, she covered in her career. I think she covered roughly five thousand murders, but. Here's the thing about sort of the late 70s compared to 1980. Miami used to average about 120 murders a year. That was a sort of norm. And actually, we're back down to that today in a much bigger city, which is amazing. But in 1980, it shoots up to very close to 600 murders. Same in 81 again. So basically, you've st but, but nothing changes. So if you're a captain of homicide or the crime reporter, you're basically doing roughly 400% more work than you were, you were doing a couple of years ago. And Edna Buchanan never shies away from that. Uh, and and she she makes this, this promise that she's going to put every murder in the paper, even if it's just a line, which at one point, that's what it comes down to. Uh, but she's so important in 1980, because at the very beginning of that year, she is the one who breaks the story uh, of the police cover up of the death of a black motorist. And this is going to be uh, ostensibly the biggest story of the year in in Florida and and uh, and just to be clear um, I remember reading I, I used to love her her uh, her reporting because her stories were had a beginning a middle and an end they really were they were almost uh, fable kinds of uh, they, there was always a point to them you never um, you you never walked away disappointed from an Edna Buchanan story uh, but she had extraordinary access and I remember reading in, in a review of one of her books that <clears throat> that she was uh, astonishingly pro-police um, that and so uh, she gets these stories uh, she gets the McDuffie story in a way because she was almost a part of the department in 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 some ways. She was. She was, now there was a time before her. The old the old the, the man who had who had the crime reporting job before her was actually Janet Reno's father, Henry Reno. And in those days, the crime reporter for the Herald actually had a desk inside the police department. So it was very hard. Uh, to separate to separate the two, Ed, Edna wasn't like that though. Edna had called out bad cops before. She'd been married to cops, but she got she got cops, uh, and she had all the time in the world for cops. Uh, but but she would often find, as she always said, that she would always keep photographs of the officers of the month on her desk because inevitably those were the very same officers who would end up in trouble, you know, a year later, two years later. Her theory was that it was exactly the same things. 
you know, men or women who are willing to rush into danger and make hasty decisions that could make you a hero. But in the wrong cir circumstances, those same, same, same attributes could make you an absolute villain. Hmm. And, uh, and so let's come to, uh, to McDuffie. Uh, tell a little bit about uh, who Arthur McDuffie was and, uh, and set the scene because it is, it is uh, stunning and instructive and in some ways uh, depressing um, to see the parallels uh, between what the story you tell in 1980 uh, and the story of George Floyd and what's happened uh, in the United States in 2020. Sure. Arthur McDuffie was, you know, every definition of a, of a solid American citizen. He'd served in the army, he'd been a Marine, he'd been stationed on aircraft carriers, he'd been honorably discharged. Uh, he was divorced. He had three kids. Uh, he was trying to get back together with his wife the night before, uh, it, the night before he's, he's beaten, uh, he spends with his wife. Unfortunately, the night that he's beaten, uh, he decides to spend with a lover, which is part of the problems. So on that night, uh, he oversleeps at the lover's house, wakes up at one in the morning and realizes he better hightail it back uh, because he's promised his ex-wife, who he's still courting, uh, that he's going to take care of the kids that night. And at 1, 1 1.45 in the morning, he, well, there are three theories of what he did. He either uh, rolled through a stop sign or popped a wheelie or flipped a finger at a police officer. All three accounts were given by police uh, later on. Uh, and so starts this, this chase in the middle of the night. And he's cha he goes uh, back and forth between county and city lines. So he's chased by not one, but two police departments. And by the time they catch up with him, or rather by the time he pulls over and shouts, I give up, he's chased by 15 cop cars. Uh, now, as he shouts, I give up, he's dragged off the back of his motorcycle, which he's already put the kickstand down. Uh, and this sort of brawl starts. It was described later by one of the policemen as something almost out of the the sort of uh, Looney Tunes cartoons, uh, except there's only one man in the middle, and that's McDuffie, who weighs about 145 pounds. Uh, and he's got 15 cops who decide to start beating him. And the beating takes about two minutes before uh, an ambulance pulls up. Uh, and just before the ambulance pulls up, when McDuffie is immobile and his head's already beginning to swell, uh, the cops decide to fake the scene of an accident to try and make it look as if he'd fallen off his motorcycle at high speed during the chase. And that's the story of McDuffie as he goes into hospital. And then the next day, well, I'm sorry, three days later, right after he dies from his injuries, Edna Buchanan's phone rings and uh, an anonymous source tells her that the, the black motorcyclist who's just died of his injuries from the accident, that this wasn't an accident, that, that he'd been beaten to death by the police. And so this is, a, this is a, obviously uh, not a time when anyone has a cell phone camera and nobody is, uh, nobody is uh, um, uh, either recording or, uh, or, or broadcasting uh, any of this. Uh, the police reports are filed, uh, uh, telling of an accident. Uh, and uh, and uh, and then how did uh, as again as a as a newspaper man it's a it's a thrilling story to read uh, to see how she put together how how it was put together that it couldn't have been it couldn't have happened the way that it was written in the police report. Sure. At first, it looks like like she's wrong. She goes to probably the most trusted. Uh, coroner in the country who who is doing the autopsy, McDuffie's autopsy, uh, along with his number two, and they actually agree with the police initially that that the fracture of his skull is so violent that it had to have happened at traveling more than sixty miles an hour was the initial. Uh, but none of them had been to the scene, which Edna Buchanan does the dirty work. Uh, she goes to the scene, she looks around at what his head could have possibly struck. There was nothing his head could have possibly struck there. The next thing she does is go to the tow yard and find the motorbike that he was driving, which should have already been in police evidence, but wasn't. Uh, and if you know anything about motorcycle accidents, and she didn't know much, but she knew enough to know that when a motorcycle crashes, you're only going to get scratch marks on, on one side. Uh, and of course, 
the police who had, who had wrecked this bike had beaten it from all sides with it with uh, with their flashlights and broken glass. It, it made it made no sense. Uh, and that's when when she starts making phone calls. Uh, and soon enough, she makes the the coroner have a second look at it, and 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 the story, the police story, begins to unravel. So uh, the the coroner uh, comes to a different conclusion. Yeah, eventually the, the coroner and and the it ends up uh, the captain of homicide for the first time in Dade County history. The captain of homicide takes over takes over a, a police case. Normally, a captain is an administrator, but this is considered such an explosive possibility of what what could happen in this case that it's given to Marshal Frank, the captain of homicide, uh, and, and, and and things get ugly quickly. And things get ugly quickly. Uh, tell maybe a little bit about the riots themselves, and then let's come back to the case, uh, which goes which goes to North Florida for, um, I, I because the, there was a decision made that there couldn't be an impartial jury in Miami County, in Miami Dade, uh, Miami. I guess it was Dade County then. Yeah, it was a huge. It was a huge story, certainly in South Florida, and really, you would have thought it would have been a huge story nationally, uh, like a sort of Rodney King, and it wasn't originally. It, it was a. It was a story that started strong and then sort of became middle of the paper stuff until the trial, uh, and once you get to the trial and you've got you've got five police officers accused of everything from from murder to uh, down to to faking documents. Uh, and this trial's moved to Tampa, and it's a very contentious trial. And not because it is an all-white jury, but I would argue that it's not because it's an all-white jury that that all five officers are acquitted. It's it's you know it's a tricky case to try. You had you had to you had to immunize police officers to testify against police officers, and those who were immunized weren't exactly thrilled to be there. So so as as uh, one of the prosecuting attorneys told me they gave very grudging evidence. I think that's really apparent when you see the when you see the television uh, reports every evening. Uh, and sure enough, all are acquitted. And the the weirdest thing about it is they're acquitted. The jury's handed uh, the trial on a Friday, and the thought is it's such a complex and it's been quite a long, tricky trial that it will take them three to four days at least to sift through the evidence and maybe ask questions again. Instead. They take less than two hours on Saturday morning and return the verdict of uh, that everybody's innocent. Now, what happens when a verdict comes down on a Saturday is that means that, or every kid and high school student is is out of school and and most people aren't working. So that news goes straight onto the street on a hot, hot early summer afternoon, uh, and the first murder uh, occurs within an hour, and that's just the beginning of 48 to 48 to 72 hours of absolute insanity inside Miami. Tell a little bit about that. It starts uh, with people being dragged out of their cars as they're driving through black neighborhoods and being beaten to death with everything from bricks to being stabbed with spears to being set on fire, uh, really miserable, brutal murders. And what happens in those original, those initial moments is the police have tried to set up checkpoints. Uh, but it's often just one police car and one or two officers. So when an emergency like that is happening inside the zone that they're trying to protect, those officers have to make a choice. Do they go in and try and help or do they just try and maintain the perimeter? And those who broke and went to try and help, that suddenly meant there wasn't a perimeter. Now, when you try to rebuild a perimeter afterwards, it just got bigger and bigger. And really, the police lost control of a huge section of the city to the point where it's very obvious by I think around 9 p.m. that they're going to need the National Guard. So the National Guard come down uh, and there's basically this huge lawless section of the city uh, where there's enormous amounts of looting, murder uh, and fires being set through for two straight days. Uh, on day one, it's entirely white people being killed by blacks. And on day two, it's entirely blacks dying at the hands of whites. Uh, it's a really vicious, vicious 48 hours of American history. Uh, and, it, and it leaves the biggest black neighborhoods in Miami uh, smoldering and no jobs left, no buildings left, no work left, 
uh, it, it has a huge long-term effect. If you look at Miami in 2020, our most depressed areas in 2020 are exactly the neighborhoods that were on fire that summer. It also uh, it also is reminiscent uh, in so many ways of what has happened uh, in U.S. cities uh, recently because the uh, the the apparent lack of or the the understanding and the apparent lack of justice um, and the killing of black uh, black men of black people uh, at the hands of police and the um, either the acquittal or the uh, or the lack of action or the need for um, for extraordinary media coverage before there is official action, as in some cases, uh, is goes right to the to the the heart of the uh, the uh, the pain at the core of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, as uh, as was the case in McDuffie, and as was the case in McDuffie, I thought, uh, having read the book, when there were uh, disturbances, now riots in 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 Minneapolis and in Portland, uh, I thought very much of the the, the different tactics. Uh, that the police was trying to employ uh, to um, to control the situation, losing control, regaining control. Um, how did you how did you experience this year, having been so steeped in what happened in 1980? Sure. To me, what I found fascinating about this year was in 1980. There's the series, the, the McDuffie case is, is the last of these sort of five or six big cases that take place on Janet Reno's watch as our state attorney in 1980, uh, all involved. I don't, I don't want to I don't want to gloss over that point. The the district attorney was Janet Reno, who went on to be uh, this, the uh, the uh, secretary of uh, to be the aid attorney general. The attorney States. general. Yeah. Was gonna, I, mean, I, was, I was thinking in Latin American terms, I almost called him <laughs> the minister of justice. No, okay, <laughs> the attorney general. Yeah, uh, so so she, she basically drops the ball on five similar incidents where with black victims uh, and and white policemen, everything from wrong house raids to, to a man who was shot through the back of the head for urinating against a wall. Uh, you know, stuff that's not entirely unfamiliar. Uh, but what's the difference to me looking at 2020 is, is really the way social media works, is that, that in Miami, it took this accumulation of events inside the city of Miami to get to this incredible moment of violence. Uh, and now you can get, you know, one event happening in Kenosha, the next in, you know, Wisconsin, and, and you can jump around. And I think you can that anger can build up in the same way that it would have built up in a city. It now builds up across a nation. Uh, the other huge difference is in the aftermath of all the violence in 1980, the voices who come forward to talk about potential solutions are pretty much all white voices. And that's true of the Herald. There may be a black guest columnist here and there, but but there, there are very few black journalists working inside the Herald at the time. Uh, and across TV, it's the same 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 problem. You look at 2020. I think in 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 the wake of George Floyd, the conversation across America was driven almost exclusively uh, by black voices. I think you said in the book there was one black reporter on the Miami Herald staff and the city desk. One one black on the reporter. city desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There was a librarian. There's a consumer reports yeah. uh, journalist, but. Um, what, what was the role of television in that? Because one of the things that uh, that I, I know uh, influenced uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the civil rights movement was the uh, was the opportunity that uh, began in the '60s to to have um, with photography, but especially with uh, television, to have in the evening report. Uh, scenes of dogs being sicked on uh, peaceful demonstrators and fire hoses. Um, and, and that, I think, had a, a really significant impact on the, on the, on the psyche and the understanding. Um, I, don't, I, I don't get a sense of why TV didn't seem to have picked this up in the United States 
when it happened. Yeah, I'd say in 1980, it's still sort of the golden age of newspapers. So, so the big voice in town is definitely the Herald rather than rather than any of the local networks. Uh, having said that, they you know they did all cover. They were there to cover everything, whether it was the the uh, Mariel Boatlift or or they were inside the trial uh, of of Arthur McDuffie as well. But you know these things are reduced to I think maybe McDuffie would get ninety seconds to two minutes every night. So those sound bites really don't help to drive an understanding of the trial. And one of the crises. Uh, that happens to Miami is that this the the acquittal of all those officers is, is entirely unexpected. So the real question is why was it unexpected? Why didn't people see this? Why weren't the journalists reading the tea leaves? And the network TV journalists never suggest there's going to be anything other than, than these men are going to jail. And I'm afraid the same was true of the Miami Herald. The it, the greatest journalist who's probably ever worked in Miami was Gene Miller, who covered the trial, who won two Pulitzer Prizes. And for some reason, covering this trial, uh, he doesn't give the impression that, that this is a tricky a tricky trial. He, if anything, he gives the impression that justice justice will be served, and and certainly he he bet. I mean, he told the journalists who were, who were sitting around him in the jury room that that he was almost certain uh, one of the men was going down for murder too, which of course he doesn't. He walks. So I think the city felt incredibly unprepared because the journalists, in a way, didn't prepare them. So uh, we're we're just at a point now where we should be uh, opening this up for uh, for questions, and I I uh, I want to ask you to to just quickly reflect on uh, on uh, how Miami 1980 uh, for for you and for me since we live here uh, in Miami it's a uh, it's a it's a a touchstone uh, moment, uh, uh, and, and it is a uh, it, it has it, it helps to create the city that we uh, the community we live in. Um, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on on what what you see today in Miami that that really draws but goes back to 1980, and then maybe a little bit larger view. Uh, what about uh, what is what does it teach us in about uh, uh, the United States generally? How how is this related to uh, uh, to the rest of the country? Sure, I think my Miami 1980 is when we really this becomes uh, a predominantly Latin American city, and I think that has generally been uh, a great benefit and and something that distinguishes uh, Miami from any other city in America. And you know you need you need those things to to stand apart. And I think Miami has done a really good job at rebuilding itself in that in that image. And I would say that is self invention. Uh, you know, if the, the, at a federal level, people were hor horrified by Miami during 1980. For Carter, it was an extraordinary embarrassment, and Mariel was certainly considered one of those final nails in his coffin. Uh, but I think all of the things that, that men like Maurice Ferre had been building quietly and patiently during the 1970s survived that onslaught in 1980 and really drove Miami out the other side. So the craziest stat you can come up with is that, that you know, the uh, port, which, which you know, everyone thought the port must be taking a hit because the city's taking a hit, but it was actually enormous growth during 1980. So all those things that were in place worked. Uh, now, from American point of view, I would say Miami was like this red flashing light, uh, a warning for the rest of America. A, race had not been solved in the late 60s. Uh, just because, you know, you, you were busing black school children to new schools and, and, you know, just because the economy had been okay until, until the late 70s when it takes yet another uh, bash doesn't mean that, that race isn't going to poke up its head again. And here we are 40 years later, we're in exactly the same same position. But I think the other two issues that year, cocaine and immigration, uh, were seen as Miami's issues, but they certainly weren't. Those were geopolitical issues that just landed flat on Miami's doorstep. And the government at a federal level did its best to sort of uh, walk away shyly from them because 1980, the, the week before Mariel Boatlift happens, Ted Kennedy passes the, a new immigration act, 
and it is it doesn't work because Mariel proves that it's riddled with holes because it, it doesn't work at all. Uh, so I think it was the it was this big red flag waving that America we've got problems they may be arriving in Miami but they're coming your way and had for instance more people been sent down in that first wave of Operation Greenback could we have done a better job uh, at keeping cocaine at bay in America maybe uh, and the same and the same for immigration. I think there's some uh, it's it's a it's a it's a uh, a bit of an irony that. Um, the McDuffie story uh, seems, in retrospect, to have to have faded in uh, as it relates to Miami. Though it's clear that it's a story that uh, was to be repeated and is and continues to be repeated uh, in the United States. Uh, whereas the story that uh, seemed uh, for the longest time to not fade was the. Miami Vice, uh, Scarface, uh, Miami as Sin City, uh, violence, cocaine, uh, uh, the the kind of uh, of uh, insane amounts of cash money uh, fueling um, uh, an economy gone or a, a society gone amok uh, that ultimately led to that paradise lost, that famous paradise lost. Uh, Time magazine cover. Um, what are your reflections on that? What was it that made Miami Vice, beside the fact that those guys had uh, the the coolest pastel jackets, um, but uh, the Miami Vice and the architectonica building with the palm tree yeah. in the center? Um, what was it that made that story so compelling uh, to the to the country? Whereas the McDuffie story. Uh, that is a story that should have had resonance throughout the country, uh, doesn't seem to. Have. Yeah, I mean, obviously that the Miami Vice series traveled very well, even in England in the 1980s, we were all wandering around in our rolled up silk jackets in the rain. Uh, but I would, you know, I think part well, of this comes back. That, that must have been, that must have been it quite was, a sight. It was very soggy, yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the fascinating things that Maurice Ferre does in early 1981, he's just had this year from hell. And what, instead of trying to brush it under the carpet, like a lot of the Chamber of Commerce want to do, what he does is he invites 60 journalists from all over the world to come to Miami. And he does not only, you know, wants to give them the beach uh, experience, but he takes them, uh, he has them taken to the riot zones. He has them he, has, he takes them to Tent City, where the Mariel refugees had to live under I-95. Uh, you know, he takes them to, they, they have a sort of cocaine tour of Miami as well. And, you know, everyone's thrilled. Uh, and this, and by the way, it's snowing in New York, so they can't believe that they're in 80 degrees. And, uh, you know, it's this bizarre, bizarre junket. But I think that sort of helps sow the seeds that that, that Miami can recreate its attraction as not just the sun city, but like a sun city with a sprinkle of danger. Uh, and I think that's something Miami surfs for the next decade. Uh, you know, the most crime infested neighborhoods in, in Miami then become the very neighborhoods that attract attract the developers in that in that next wave, such as Miami, where I live in South Miami Beach. Uh, we, you know, we, we were the worst neighborhood in, in I think, the whole of America. Uh, and and you know that now we're very polished and shiny, uh, but why did McDuffie fade? Well, I think that story it's an old story, and and yes, the Rodney King story survived, and you know we all know that one. But why was McDuffie forgotten? It's a great question, one that you know I'm trying to help uh, get a plaque up on 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 the spot where McDuffie was beaten, because I don't even think if you're under fifty, even if you live in Miami, you just don't know that story. Uh, and yet it was, you know, it's a, it's a story we, if we were paying more attention to the time, maybe we wouldn't have to relive that story uh, again and again in American history. Twelve years later, uh, Hurricane Andrew um, came through South Dade County like a cyclone. And, uh, and uh, at about that time, a little bit after that time, uh, after the rebuild and 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 uh, many many thousands of families took the insurance money and moved north. 
um, Latin America opened up and uh, started moving to uh, started moving to Miami. Um, in 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 many ways, uh, it seems to me that this was a uh, uh, that this that the setup that allowed this to happen um, might have been with the assimilation of that uh, Marielle group. Can you say something about uh, how that how long that took and and um, and 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 what that ultimately resort, uh, resulted in? Yeah, so that Marielle group get absolutely vilified. Uh, not so much in the local press, but certainly in the national press. There's a famous New York Times uh, article that which basically accuses all everyone arriving from Mariel of being sort of either a criminal or a leper. Uh, and it was a very sensationalist headline, and that really did tilt. The one week, the New York Times was writing op-eds about how every immigrant should be allowed into America, and the, a week later they were talking about keeping the hordes at bay. It was It was a bizarre bizarre time. But within three years, 98% of people who arrived in Marielle had jobs, housing, and kids in school. Uh, so, And the, the stats from Marielle are much like any other super successful uh, burst of immigration. They've, as, a, as a group, they've all done really well. Uh, the 4,000 criminals included in that 125,000 people who came over, uh, not so well. A lot of them ended up in kept in jail for for I mean in Atlanta for years and years and years, uh, and they were also ended up on on the morgue tables for for the first two or three two or three years after arriving. They drove the coroner insane. He was the the Marielle on Marielle violence was was the worst of all. Uh, so in a way, Marielle sorted itself out pretty quickly. The, the four thousand, even if it wasn't obvious the day they landed, it became pretty obvious who they were. Uh, and I think, generally speaking, they've been very well absorbed and 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 you know a blessing for the community. Politically, um, the absorption of that group uh, was also aided by the Cuban Adjustment Act that uh, that allows for a very fast, a very much faster process uh, towards citizenship and the opportunity uh, to vote. There was a concentration. There was a tug of war. As I recall, between the Carter administration and Mascanosa, the Carter administration had wanted to disperse the uh, the influx. Mascanosa argued for a concentration. Uh, ultimately, uh, there was a concentration, and the and the demographics of Miami uh, shifted again very, very quickly and very, very radically, uh, so that uh, Miami becomes. Uh, not just a very Hispanic city, but a very, um, uh, a very uh, uh, actively political uh, city, and uh, leads, uh, unlike other major cities, uh, leans um, Republican because of the uh, of the uh, uh, Kennedy presidency during uh, the Bay of Pigs and the. Uh, and the Cuban uh, um, uh, shift toward uh, Republicans uh, since then. I wonder how much of that ends up in the uh, in the shifting, and that's of course a, a very incomplete um, uh, telling of of all that happened because that that second and third generation of Cuban uh, also voted for Barack Obama. So. Uh, I'm not sure where it all ends up, except except in a very very divided state where Miami, that I think at one point could have been seen as solidly a Democrat city, is um, the county in, in any case is uh, uh, is a very very split operation. Yeah, you get these huge surprises down here, like uh, in 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 that election in 1980. Uh, the the amount of Democrats who walk away from Carter was staggering. Uh, so Re Reagan wins before 9 p.m., in which you know seemed in, uh, utterly against grain at that time. So so if, I mean, if we're talking, if we're trying to forecast what happens down in Miami in in, in early November here, uh, I you know you'd be a brave man to to place a bet. But you know I see plenty of evidence on. You go, you drive down any street. I feel like half the streets Trump and half the streets Biden. I don't. I think it's going to. Well, we may have to wait more than three or four hours this time. Yeah. 
Um, as a as a wait, where where do you think Miami is leading today? If it was a leading indicator um, on these immigration issues, the drug issues, the race and police brutality issues, uh, how do you see the city today? And what 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 are the what are the uh, what are the things other other people should be looking at in in uh, in a in a in a cauldron like city uh, as Miami continues to be? Sure, on the dark side, I would say we're leading in insurance fraud, <laughs> uh, and we Florida was certainly at one time leading in in imprisoning uh, people of color in the '90s, which then became a trend across the United States. Uh, I would say now we are leading in uh, certainly exposure to climate change, another great another great issue for us down here. But I'd also say from a positive standpoint, we are a much, uh, we're no longer resting on one or two legs. I think in 1980, between tourism and cocaine, uh, that really was a, an enormous part of, of what was going on down here. Uh, now I think we have a much much more balanced, though not entirely balanced sector. Things like a tech industry that certainly didn't exist even ten years ago uh, have now reappeared thanks to efforts from from plenty of places. And you know I think we're net beneficiaries on 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 you know, tax law across other states. And I think a lot of people who are moving down here with a lot of money in their pockets are, are, are looking locally in a way that they weren't before. So you know I I'm generally very bullish. On Miami, I do worry about climate, but uh, but but you know, again, we may be first, but we're certainly not going to be the only people exposed. I wonder uh, when I moved here. I remember thinking there were still so many people. This was in the mid '90s. Um, so many people who were talk who were uh, from the moment I got here, I kept finding people who were even newer than me. Uh, in, in the place, and um, and it struck me that an awful lot of them continued to have the idea that this was a uh, a, a place of transience, that this was a place uh, where uh, they might have an opportunity at that moment, uh, either when the dot com uh, bubble uh, before the bursting of the dot com bu bubble, or uh, people who had come for one reason or another still maintained an incredible, incredibly strong ties uh, to where they came from, whether it was Kansas or Columbia. And the lack of commitment to place uh, always struck me as a particularly difficult Miami place. I don't sense that as much now. And I wonder if that's simply a matter of time or if it's in the case of Cubans, uh, the people who felt that were people who were born on the island and have passed on, and the people that uh, the Cubans that are, that the vast majority of Cubans who live in Miami now are are, are U.S. born um, uh, uh, citizens and, and residents, and so they've never actually lived someplace else. How do you see that 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 transition from transience to a commitment to place? Sure, I mean, for me, whether you're coming from Bogota or from Havana or from New York, you're coming from cities that are hundreds of years old, uh, you know, with with deep, deep, deep roots. So, of course, you, you should feel allegiance to them. And I think, you know, the, the thing is, this is an incredibly young city. Uh, you know, even today, the city of Miami is, is young and small. Uh, you know, yes, we've only got Whatever it is, four hundred and twenty thousand people inside the city, inside the city limits, and there's a county. We're now, you know, roughly around around three million. So we're growing. But I, to me, I now bump into people uh, all the time, especially for instance, my kids' schools, where you're bumping into the parents, and the parents went to the same school. I don't think you could have found that uh, twenty five years ago. So I do feel like the roots, the roots come. But you know, you can't expect too much from a young city. We're Two one hundred and fifty years younger than New York, or something like that. So, so give us a chance, and and you know we we may be sort of a teenager of cities, but we're getting there, and we're getting there fairly quick. It is stunning to think that Miami was chartered. I think it was in eighteen ninety eight, uh, ninety seven or ninety eight. So uh, there were institutions that we go to in New York uh, that were already established. Um, at the time that Miami uh, was even chartered. 
Um, and, and, uh, so I, 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 I give, I give, I give, you've got to have some leeway. On the other hand, uh, we live in a fast world and people want, uh, uh want the city to, to, uh, uh, to grow as fast as, uh, as our demands. Did, um, did Edna Buchanan, um, uh, read the book and has she commented on it? <laughs> she is the, I've sent, I sent copies to pretty much everyone who, appeared in it or have been or people have reached out to me uh and generally speaking people have been very kind about it the only total silence has been from edna edna oh, buchanan really? so i have no idea what what she she makes of it i can only hope uh she approves of her representation but but i just don't know well if she's, if she's if she's uh on this uh on this call there the the chat line is open uh, so <laughs> she or anyone else could ask uh Ask ask you an embarrassing question, um, uh, and what about are any of the uh, did any of the lawyers? Uh, uh, and I imagine some of them or some of the police uh, are probably still around. Have any of them commented? Uh, yes, a, couple, a few lawyers have reached out to me and uh, given me a general nod of approval. Uh, fairly succinct, and I think I've been invited to speak uh, to a, to a whole host of lawyers in a couple in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, so I, I hope I pass that uh, that gauntlet, but but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Well, um, I I, uh, I I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I enjoyed it as a uh, as a as a as a story. I enjoyed it. Uh, as history, and I uh, and I enjoyed it as a as a, a description of how we got uh, uh, to where we got in a city that stands right in the center of North and South. Um, Maurice Ferre died not long ago. Um, in in uh, in the last part of the book, uh, he really uh, he really shines as. Uh, as a man with a with a vision, and yet he was not the one who was able to to take the city um, where he uh, uh, where he thought where he thought it was going, where he thought it should go. Um, was he simply the victim of uh, of uh, community politics of uh, of ethnic politics? Well, I think. He, he he was fairly blunt with me, uh, and we we spent a lot of time together. I think he knew he knew what he'd done to hold on to power. Uh, he basically, you know, he he was always a mayor who who whose strength was that he could jump across any lines. Uh, you know, in a way, he was a Latin who had been educated at a wasp who drew his deepest uh, voting loyalty from the black community. It was amazing, amazing thing to do in Miami during those years. But towards the end, he he lost that Latin vote to, to Cuban Americans. Uh, and so he very much rode a, a sort of black Anglo vote. Uh, and I think he regretted uh, helping really cement those lines that I think have deepened since and really siloed the races in, in this city. And that's the sort of city we we still live in. If if there's a weakness in the city, I would think it would be that, that there are not enough places where where the races come together. You know, everyone's quite seems reasonably happy to self segregate, but but I don't think that's a, an ideal. And you know, we we always say we're a melting pot, but we look more like a TV dinner down here. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that's come up in the uh, in the chat is if you wish you had lived in Miami forty years ago, uh, or <laughs> Or, or as, you, what, as what? <laughs> as, <laughs> as a cocaine dealer, a journalist? A, uh, I yeah. don't. The, the questioner doesn't <laughs> say. Uh, I, I wonder. Do you do you think it's a much better city now, or do you think there were things that were there forty years ago that uh, that you wish we still had? Oh, I think as a news town, you hopefully you'll never have another year like nineteen eighty, because of course. News towns are normally built around, you know, bad things, and there was plenty happening here. So I think it was a tremendously exciting place to be if you were a journalist uh, in 1980. And actually, if you, you know, were working uh, for law enforcement agencies, obviously it was an incredibly trying year, but also uh, a year like no other to test yourself. So I think as, yeah, as a, as a 
young person that would have been a very exciting place to be. However, I'm very relieved that I live in even 2020, which is certainly full of uh, uh, turbulence. I'd still yeah. prefer that to, to 1980. As uh, I, I, you mentioned as a journalist, I, I, I read your book as a journalist. I, do you, but it's also history. Do you, do you think of yourself as a, as a? I should hold up the book so that it's, uh, so that everyone knows the copy they're supposed to buy. Um, but do, do you think of yourself as a journalist when you write these, or do you think of yourself as a historian? Well, I was told by a historian that I'm not allowed to think of myself as a historian. <laughs> Uh, because I don't have my PhD in, in history and therefore I'm or an MA or anything else. So I guess I would call myself a slow motion journalist. I'm only good at reading the tea leaves once there's no water in the cup. You know, I, I just need things to, to slow down to sort of have a, a glimpse at recent history. So I'm, I'm some sort of bastardized mixture of the two, but but I'm happy in that spot. Who, who's... who's uh... Who's a what? What, what is a fig? Who is a figure that uh, who, whose history writing you you uh, or is there someone that, whose history writing you would emulate? Oh, I quite admire. You know, I know they dismissed as sort of uh, popular historians or narrative historians, but I but I like I very much like the sort of uh, Eric Larson's and Gilbert Gilbert Kings. I mean, if you've read Gilbert King's Devil in the Grove about Florida, I think that's an extraordinary piece of. Mm -hmm. Again, do you call it do you call it history or do you call it journalism? But but it's just an absolutely first rate book, and I, I you know things like that I could read read all day long. Let's end on uh, on civic engagement because it's one of the things that to go back to my earlier question that I when I first moved here I I was struck by the number of people who talked about returning to where they came from and the and the and the. And the, the, my concern was not so much that I believe they actually would go back, but that in all of those years, they would stay away from engaging in the community. They would be, uh, there were there were funds that were, uh, that were being amassed for when we would return to Cuba or people would, uh, would not would not make permanent plans because they intended to return uh, to Venezuela or they intended to return to Argentina or they they were only going to be here uh, for a period of time before they returned to New York uh, where my family lives that that sort of thing I um, uh, I, I wonder what what is it uh, there, there's so much to be said about uh, uh, local civic engagement and and is is what do you, what do you find uh, actually makes it happen? Does it does it simply require the lack of of knowledge of what came past or the lack of opportunity uh, to well, return? I think, I think 1980 shows you that the, the biggest motivation is a threat. Uh, and I think once once you once you feel threatened, then then you can feel grounded. Uh, and I think for the Cuban American community, there's no better example, right? They they had the slap in the face that that they realized no other community really appreciated what they'd done for Miami, and suddenly you had this extraordinary addiction to domestic policy and and the seeking of power. Uh, so I think that's a lesson that should be learned by every immigrant community that if you really want to say at the table, it begins with registering to vote. Uh, and then getting your own leaders on the ballot and, and moving up the food chain. And, I, you know, you look at the Cuban-American community last presidential run, you had both Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio getting fairly close to the Golden Chalice. You know, that's extraordinary for, for, for a community that really hasn't been here, been here that long. Uh, so, yeah, involvement is, is absolute key. And I think you see, you see plenty, plenty of that in Miami. I think there's the, the green, you know, green shoots at the very least and civic, civic engagement. It, it is here. Uh, we need we need more and we need more to cover it. That's one of our weaknesses in, in Miami. We need a stronger newspaper. We need st stronger television uh, coverage. But, but you know, we're, we're, we're OK. Amen to that. Uh, what's your next book? I'm not going to tell you, but I am going to knock on your door soon and ask you for help. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So it must be about nuclear physics. <laughs> you got it in one. <laughs> 
Nick, it's always wonderful having uh, talking with you and uh, sharing some time. I I, uh, I appreciate it. I'm sure that uh, all the folks on uh, on the call appreciate it. Uh, thank you, thank you very very much. And uh, Susan, I'll, I I I think I turn it back. Oh, I turn it to uh, Patty and Gustavo Cisneros and thank them for this, their their sponsorship. Uh, and Susan, thanks for hosting all of us. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Patty and Gustavo. Thank you, Patty. Gustavo, it's, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Susan, thank you very much for your, for your wonderful sponsorship. Thank you, Guillermo Subillaga. And of course, Señor Ibargüen, un abrazo. Muchas gracias. <laughs> and Nick was brilliant. Terrific. Take care. Bye bye. Th thanks all of you for joining us. Enjoy the book or read it again. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Be safe. Thanks.